head back there. So anyways, this is my friend Ben. Say hi, Ben. <laughs> Good job. Uh, ben and I go uh, back pretty far. Ben's going to talk about incident response today. Um, I promise this uh, talk is worth your time. It's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, take it away, Ben. Thanks, Carson. Uh, so uh, my name is Ben Ridgway. Uh, I am from the Microsoft Security Response Center, uh, specifically the team responsible for uh, watching after security incidents in the other cloud. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we have one. Uh, so uh, specifically, I'm in charge of uh, crisis response for all of our government cloud offerings. So if it's big, bad, goes bump in the cloud, and somebody in the US federal government uh, is going to get struck by it, that's my team. That's my group that's responsible for us uh, responding to that. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit off the beaten path from your standard security conference talk uh, today. Uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of excellent content today talking about the uh, technological measures uh, that we employ during incident response investigations. Uh, the, you know, everybody out front is selling a box that will help us find all of our bad guys, will help us look for all of our vulnerabilities and all of our software. Um, but nobody is selling a box that will help uh, my corporate vice president make a good decision when he or she is faced with the possibility of a data breach, the potentially millions of dollars of fines, uh, potentially uh, the loss of his job and, or her job, and the jobs of everybody reporting to them. If anybody sells that product and it is legal under federal law, please come talk to me afterwards. I really, really love to uh, learn about this. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> you get a coin, sir. Uh, so not every incident involves technology, uh, but every incident involves the rational and logical collaboration of human beings all hopefully w working together to solve a common problem. So we're going to start out and we're going to use our imaginations. I said this was a bit unorthodox. So imagine it's 340 million years ago and you're this little guy right here, uh, this sort of unremarkable looking little lizard thing. Well, this is, lizard is remarkable for one reason. It is the last known shared ancestor between the mammalian uh, family tree and uh, the reptile family tree. So you're sitting there on a branch, you're eating some tasty bugs, and you feel eyes upon you. Now, luckily for you, you have a very highly developed part of your brain that makes a split second decision whether you're going to fight, flight, or freeze. Do you want to go you know, fight back against? Do you want to run away? Or do you want to sit down and hope that nobody sees you? So uh, luckily for you, you freeze. The, the danger passes on because it thinks you're part of the twig. Fast forward another 300 million years ago, uh, 300 million years, and you're now an early primate, one of our earlier, early simian ancestors. And through some complicated set of, of hooting and hand gestures and whatever, one of, uh, a member of your family tribal unit is accusing you of stealing the last piece of tasty fruit. And you are very upset about this because you know that your family unit has absolutely no tolerance for that sort of thing. And if they think that you are guilty of this, they will throw you out of the tree, you will be all by yourself, and you will be raptor food before long. You are fighting basically to preserve your sense of honor, preserve your sense of self, your, and pres preserve your life at the end of the day. In both of the situations I've described, the part of the brain that is active is something known as the amygdala. Uh, that's the scientific term for it. I'm going to call this the lizard brain or the monkey brain. Fast forward today, uh, humans now have a very large developed part of the brain called the hippocampus. This is the large gray matter that is mostly in the front of the brain. It's responsible for all of our rational and logical thought. It's responsible for having created the digital watch, the internet, all the, the, the cloud, all the other awesome things that we rely on today. Now, here's the thing. The amygdala is still there. All of the functions that evolved millions of years ago are still there, and those functions still come out when you believe or that there is a dangerous situation where your uh, life and, and, or the lives around you are in jeopardy. This is super handy if you are actually in danger or if you are a phys an athlete or somebody who relies on, on basically instinctual physical response to issues. It's not really so handy if you're a security responder. As it turns out, an active amygdala gets in the way of the rational thought that we need as we are responding to security incidents. So 
I gave you all that background so we can talk about how to deal with that. How do we prevent that, that monkey brain, that amygdala from taking over so that our team, our bosses, everybody working with us uh, it, can uh, do their best work during a security incident. So first of all, let's acknowledge that nobody comes to the security team or nobody's talking to the security team because they're having a good day, right? Nobody comes to me and say, hey, Ben, you know, I just wanted to let you know everything is great and hunky-dory right now. No, they come to us because, like, oh, my gosh, everything is, it's the end of the world, and I have bad guys running through my network, and I don't know what to do. Security incidents are scary and violating for most teams that don't do this every single day. They're very unusual. Uh, and they're often caused by somebody making a mistake. Remember I mentioned that that monkey brain likes to fight to preserve the sense of self. Nothing impacts the sense of self like learning that you or your team is the cause for something that can cause harm to you or everybody else around you. So the first thing we're going to learn about is how do we spot the monkey brain? How do we realize when either ourselves or the people that we are working with may be triggered into a non-optimal state of mind? Uh, I love this, the quote that I put down at the bottom. It comes from a book called Conflict Communication. It's actually, this is uh, for law enforcement and de-escalating conflict situations. Uh, but uh, this guy, Rory Miller, puts it very well. If you care, if you feel emotion, if you're passionate about your causes, then the part of the brain that makes good decisions is offline. And this is true in all sorts of incidents, you know, events in our lives, not just our jobs, not just our, our security response. So the first thing that people, uh, that's often the tell when somebody is triggered into monkey brain is that of a physical response. Everybody has a slightly different physical response. Uh, people who play poker are really adept at reading this. This is often a lot of what they're doing. But people, you know, go in, you'll notice that people will actually start subconsciously trying to protect the soft, squishy bits of their body, their stomach. They're, you know, the places where they feel most vulnerable. Sometimes people who are worried about, uh, like, having done something wrong intellectually will actually hold on to their face or hold on to their head. This is a tell that somebody is, is either triggered or is about ready to be triggered. People who either intensely dislike, which is obvious, or start intensely liking the people that are working around. If you are overcome with an emotion of, wow, this person is awesome, they're, they're here to save the day, and, and they're the best colleague I've ever had, that, I, I swear, that does happen sometimes. I've never experienced it myself, but I, people tell me it's a thing. Uh, that, those are both signs that, that uh, you know, you may be triggered or somebody else may be triggered. Uh, people who are triggered uh, will really fixate on proving that they're right. Again, trying to uh, preserve that ongoing sense of self, your, your self-definition of who you are. Uh, along those lines, how starts to trump what? Uh, I told this to my wife as I was practicing this and she got super upset with me. Uh, the monkey cares whether the toilet paper goes over the top or under the bottom. The, the hippocampus doesn't, just wants to make sure that there's toilet paper there. Uh, that's sort of an you know, example of that sort of thinking. People who are triggered will start engaging in labeling. This is where you see a lot of racist, sex, sexist, or in corporate America what seems to be acceptable is positionalist. Uh, conversations. I'm not going to listen to that person. Uh, he's just a PM. Or, oh, he's just an intro dev. I'm not going to listen to that person. That's something that people who are triggered will often start falling into. And of course, excuses and justifications. I'm sure you've all been there. I I've certainly been there in my own life when you start well, trying to make excuses for why we got here, what went wrong, what happened. It often doesn't matter. It's the fact is we are here and we're trying to get out of it. So once you've identified what's going on, the first step is to de-escalate yourself. So the, the human brain has a really uh, remarkable ability to pick up subconsciously on when people around, specific, especially leaders, are triggered. Uh, this actually comes back, this is uh, thought to be another uh, evolutionary adaptation. You don't need to receive communication from the tribe around you. If something's wrong, you just know that something is wrong. The effect of this is that it is nearly impossible to keep a team grounded in reality when their leader is flying off the rocker. So the, the hard thing about this is the monkey is very insidious and likes to insist that it is not in control. Uh, this is partially because the being in monkey brain, being out of your right mind, uh, is generally considered to be, you know, uh, 
not okay, this is something to be frowned on. It'll probably be even worse for all of you today after having this talk because you're gonna be, you're gonna be aware of it, so sorry about that. But I'm gonna give you a hint. So one of the, the best things you can do is recognize the problem, take five minutes. I've never actually been in an incident that didn't allow for five minutes for the leader to go like in the kitchen and you know, center themselves and take care of it. Our world doesn't really move that fast. It may seem like it does, but I tell you, I swear it doesn't. If you can't get out of it then, you can the, actually just admitting this to your team. You know what, guys, I'm sorry, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, a bit upset at the moment. Just mentioning that. Remember I said that the monkey itself is sort of insidious and sort of dishonorable? Well, if you admit it and your team is like, all right, whatever, that, that's cool, that completely takes the power of that emotional state away from that and will often drop you back into normality uh, almost instantly. If you find yourself getting uh, triggered and stuck in these situations over and over and over again, it's probably time for you to take a break. I'll talk a little bit more about this, but one of the uh, biggest problems with fatigue is that it actually makes it a lot easier for you to get uh, triggered into one of these situations. So what do you do with other people? So one of, the, one of my favorite skills is to use team speak. So in security response, we really love to be the, the superheroes, the knights in shining armor who are charging in to save the day. Don't worry, we are here to save you from yourselves, you stupid morons. Because you thought that password was really clever, you showed up on Shodan, and some dude scraped your, uh, you know, your RDP session and now knows everything about you. The problem is, is that sets up a very strong us versus you, even though you're supposed to be there to save the day, that will set up a, you know, a two different warring tribes within your, uh, within your team. It's much better to try to bring everybody. Everything you do, try to create one large team. We're in this together. This is how we're gonna do it. Good job, team. Go guys, go girls. Like, trying to use these words that are very, very inclusive will help bring everybody together. Make sure that you're very liberal while highlighting triumphs. So an interesting thing happens when you uh, give somebody a compliment. The people surrounding the person who received the compliment will actually see that that is happening and they will start to subconsciously trust that leader and trust that that leader is more on their side. So the truth is you don't even need a compliment everybody in the room, you just got to pick one person and say, sir, that is a wonderful hoodie right there. That is, that is the best hoodie. And everybody else in the room is like, oh, this guy's really, he's, he's kind of nice. All right, we'll follow. We'll, we'll, do with, we'll do what he's saying. We'll listen to him. He's got funny pictures on his slides, right? So another tra uh, trap that we fall into very often as security responders is post-morteming during the incident, right? We like to get in there and figure out who screwed up, uh, you know, why did we get to this point? What went wrong? How did we get here? Well, oftentimes it doesn't matter. And if you keep fixating on the, the person who thought that password was a clever password, who, who didn't really understand what this whole SSL thing was, or was using SSL3 instead of TLS or S, anyway, we're going on, right? If you keep fixating on that, you will set up that person as a scapegoat. That person and all the people around them will start to become defensive. They start getting triggered into the monkey brains and they are no longer uh, good partners. Unless it is directly relevant to getting you out of the cur current situation, how we got here doesn't matter. And it's m far better to just, you know what, I'm gonna note that, I'm gonna write it down and we're gonna get back to it later because, because that's a far better way to keep things moving. If you find people that are always getting on your nerves, that are always going against you, uh, who, are, who are constantly fighting with what you want, it's really important to learn how to empathize with them. Uh, sit in there, try to figure out, try to see it from their situation. Even put yourself in their shoes and repeat back to them what you think that their position is. And, oh, I understand that, that you know, Spectre Meltdown fixes, yeah, that gave you a 15% slowdown in your system. Yeah, that would be really bad, wouldn't it? But we also really can't have s customers sniffing each other. That's not a good idea. You know, it's, it, it really helps to actually put yourself in their shoes and, and show them that you understand where they're coming from. Only then will they be truly open and actually be open to change. 
And finally, if you are the leader of the incident, be open with your plans. You know, we like to keep things very close hold. Uh, I found that, you know, we do have to have a satisfied need to know, but it's also very important to make sure that everybody knows the direction that we're going in. So one of the problems with monkeys is they love, to, they thrive in leaderless situations. People do very well in senses where there are perceived leaders. And I don't necessarily mean a leader who's the part of the, the highest point of the you know, organizational hierarchy. That's often less important than the person who is directing the way that the investigation is going. Um, worse still is that when, uh, when a, a lack of leadership is perceived, people will step in and try to become the leader. And generally, the people that step in are the loudest monkeys, the people who are most triggered. And so you'll end up in a situation where the people who are least qualified, who are least in the right mind to be running the incident, are the people trying to take leadership position. It's really important to have a very strong chain of command, a very strong uh, organizational momentum towards having one or you know, group of people who are actually in the driver's seat. But what happens if you are supposedly running one of these things and you have absolutely no idea what you're doing? Well, first of all, remember that nobody does. We're all just making this up uh, as we go. Don't tell everybody that you're just making it up. <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, but often, just pick a direction and go. It really, it's amazing to me how rarely it actually matters which one of, say you have three options, whether you choose door A, B, or C, it doesn't necessarily matter just moving will often show you the next breadcrumb in the investigation. It will help get you unblocked and moving to the next thing. If you do this, it's important not to lead through ignorance. It's important to make sure that you open up your ears and are listening very, very carefully because very often the next step will reveal itself. Another thing to be very uh, conscious of is avoiding analysis paralysis. If you have uh, been involved in an investigation, and you've figured out that an admin has your domain golden ticket and you've already decided you have to burn down the forest and rebuild your entire environment, does it really matter that you have 300 outstanding forensics jobs? Do you really need to uh, uh, un uh, unearth every single leaf and finish everything? It probably doesn't actually matter. It's sometimes important to put a stop on the investigation, move straight to remediation. So a very interesting thing happens when people are fatigued, and it comes from the fact that the hippocampus, the human brain, is the largest consumer of energy uh, in the human body. Uh, it is one of the main customers for downtime. As the function, as people get more and more and more tired, the longer they're on, the, the more stressed out they are, the more the function of the human brain starts to decrease. And in order to fill the gap, the more the amygdala starts to pick up on the slack and starts to become more and more active. Um, so as it turns out, the longer we're awake, the less likely we are to be making uh, the, the rational decisions of doing the things that we need uh, most during incidents. So it's really natural for most of our teams to burn hard. Uh, even my group that has a follow the sun model uh, has to work with teams that don't. Um, adrenaline has a tendency of masking fatigue. People, you know, security incidents are exciting. Sometimes they're fun. Uh, and people will start to forget that they're, they're tired and not, start, uh, not pay attention uh, to uh, the, the cues that their body is giving them. So we set up very specific rules for how long any particular person can be involved in an incident without having uh, you know, specifically mandated downtime. So to break this down logically, your team is guaranteed to screw something up if they are fatigued. The adversary is never guaranteed to be successful at their objective. So what's more important, giving your team necessary downtime or spending 24 hours a day for a month fighting an adversary. Beyond the acute damage caused by stress, caused by fatigue, uh, uh, scientists are learning that when humans experience stress, when humans have long-term fatigue issues, uh, the brain creates a stress hormone known as cortisol. Uh, the body doesn't really care whether stress is real, whether it's, it's actually you're being chased through the savanna by a lion, or whether it's perceived uh, because you thought password was clever and, or you're a team, you're burning really, really hard. Your body reacts the same way. And research is actually showing that cortisol is toxic to the hippocampus uh, at sustained levels. 
it causes decreased activity in the hippocampus, and again, when the hippocampus stops working, the amygdala jumps in to fill the void. So let me say it th this way. When we drive ourselves and our teams too hard for too long, we are actually killing the part of the brain that is, we most need for success. And beyond that, there are all sorts of other physical uh, results, uh, anxiety, depression, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep problems, weight gain. We all know how hard it is to hire and retain good security talent. Uh, it's really important to keep a sight of this as you are trying to maintain a healthy and, healthy and happy team. So I'm going to close a little bit with a cliche, uh, as, and as my favorite, I'm going to quote Mr. Robot. A bug is never just a mistake. It represents something bigger, an error of thinking that makes you who you are. Security incidents and bugs are ultimately caused by humans. They are scary situations, and there's plenty of opportunities for members of the group, members of the tribe, to perceive danger. And this can have disastrous implications for us. We can fail court cases. We can, we can overlook something important. We can leave a back door on our network. We can fail to uphold you know, one of our legal or contractual obligations. As responders, we have to be acutely aware of this and help manage the health and sanity of our team. And if we do this well, we will all be far more effective at our jobs. And if you're looking for more, uh, more reading on this, uh, some, uh, some sources, I'll have these slides posted uh, up on Twitter later. Uh, again, the one I highly recommend is Conflict Communications by Rory Miller. Uh, fantastic dive into the way human brain works uh, through all of this. All right, thank you very much.